take it away, Andy. All right, thank you so much, Nagita. That was a very generous introduction, and thank you all for being here. It's it's a, it's a real pleasure to have been invited and to, to be able to speak to you all today. Um, I do have some slides I'm going to be sharing over this over this webcam. We'll see if this works. We tested this out just a little while ago. When when I go into presenter view, I may not be able to see all of you. So if you have a question at any time, just speak up because I may not be able to see you if you raise your hand or give some other nonverbal cue. So I'm going to try this now. Can everybody see that? Yes. Oh, Can you awesome. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. But we can. Okay. That, that's just the way. Sorry, it's going to be. I have two monitors. One one is showing the presenter view. One showing what what you're seeing. But uh, in any case, this this talk is probably going to be different from some other ones that you've seen during the seminar because this is not primarily focused on research. This one is focused more on how I, I, I got to, to where I am today. I am at the University of Michigan as of a few months ago as a neuroimaging consultant. And part of what I wanted to talk about was, you know, my story about why I was uh, started making the resources that I did and also what I'm doing here now and what I want to be doing in the future. So this picture, does anybody recognize this? It's okay yeah. if you don't. Okay, it's the Midwest. You may have flown over it at some point. It, it does have a lot going for it, I swear. You forget I, who you're talking to. Yeah. <laughs> what, Alabama? I mean, that's, that's a pretty happening place aside from you know, hurricanes and everything. But I, So I lived in these three... Uh, states, so Minnesota, Indiana, Ohio, but I want to focus on kind of where my journey with neuroimaging began and then where it went. So uh, I, I was a lab manager for a couple of years at OSU and did my PhD at Indiana, uh, spent my postdoc in New Haven, and now I am here in Ann Arbor, Michigan for the foreseeable future. We'll see for how long. But the story starts back in, in 2008. So I had just graduated college. Uh, I was kind of an arrogant guy back then. And I had applied for a post-baccalaureate position at the National Institutes of Health. It seemed like a really cool position. I didn't have any fMRI background. But I went out there, interviewed in, in January of that year, and I was so convinced I was going to get that job, I made no backup plans. So for the next few months, you know, I didn't hear anything, didn't hear anything, didn't hear anything, and had nothing lined up. So eventually I said, you know, what's, what's the story? And they said, well, oh, sorry, we thought we told you, which was BS, but we gave it to somebody else. You know, sorry. So for the next few months, I was looking around anything that had to do with psychology or neuroimaging, and eventually settled on a lab manager position at uh, Ohio State University. Now, when I was there, what they were using in the lab was uh, a software program called AFNI. And I'm assuming most people have heard of it. Even though I can't see you, I'm just imagining some people <laughs> nodding their heads. This is kind of weird because I have no like, facial feedback uh -huh. for what I'm saying, but I'm assuming it's, it's going well. So AFNI is, is primarily command line driven. And for me, that was, it was a real jump into the deep end of the pool because um, I, I didn't have, I had virtually no coding, no, no background in, in uh, computer science. And AFNI, if you've used it, it, it really makes some pretty severe demands on you. It expects you to know a lot about coding because virtually everything is driven by the command line. You need to know a lot about you know, physics, the statistics, and you need to have a sense for how all of this material hangs together. So it was quite uh, an upward trek. And the biggest challenge for me at the time was mainly, you know, debugging scripts, trying to find out, you know, why errors were popping up. And that, that really took up the majority of my time as, as a lab manager. But, uh, you know, in the course of, of my duties, you know, I, I helped run studies, obviously, but uh, I was also there to, to help people if anything went wrong with their analysis or if they had any 
questions about anything. But I was new to, to AFNI as well. And the first thing that I remember seeing, which, which made a huge impression on me, was when I was going across the AFNI website and they had a, a short video on how to check for motion. You know, so you could open up a time series in the viewer, open up the three orthogonal slices, and then see whether a sudden spike in activity was due to, say, motion or due to something else like maybe a scanner artifact. It was very brief. It was like 30 seconds. And there was a small voiceover. I don't know who did it. It must have been you know, maybe Bob Cox, Rick Reynolds, one of those people. But for me, just that 30 seconds gave me a lot of information. I knew more about you know, how the AFNI viewer worked. I knew what I was looking for. And more importantly, I knew how it should look if I were to do it on my own computer. And I thought, you know, wouldn't it be very convenient for everybody I'm working with in this lab? Because a lot of them come to me with similar questions or the same questions, or even it's sometimes the same person with the same question because they'll forget things, right? I mean, this, this happens to everybody. And I thought this would be really useful if maybe I could, you know, create something like this for them because then they would stop asking me and we'd both save a lot of time. It would be a win-win situation. So this was one of the, this was a pretty early one. And these were all shared internally on, on some kind of shared folder in our lab. This was about, uh, somebody had a question about SPM and saving out a cluster corrected map so they could use it with, uh, you know, display that on MRIcron. So it was pretty brief, but I started experimenting with things like, you know, zooming in, panning around, trying to direct their attention to certain things. And it was almost like they could, you know, watch over my shoulder while I was doing something. And then they could replicate it on their machine and use whatever data I was using as kind of a surrogate for the actual data they would use. So this was a success in my estimation. People stopped talking to me most of the time because they didn't have as many questions because I could address most of them through these internally uh, produced videos. And so it was like that for uh, about a year. And then I applied to graduate school and got into Indiana University. And I didn't think too much about, about those videos at the time. I was you know, busy getting started up with everything. But I did pay attention to what worked, what seemed to be successful, and what seemed to impede them from learning certain concepts and certain techniques. So I did condense all of this into a couple of goals. And here's the order in which I, I had them, which may seem a little bit backwards to people, but let me explain. The first one was to, uh, number one, understand how to do the steps even if it's building in muscle memory, even if they don't really understand what's going on, it's always a lot more uh, uh, attractive and accessible to start you know, getting in there and messing around with stuff. And it, more importantly, knowing that you have a template to follow that will generate some result and you won't just run straight into a dead end. And then once they have that and they know they have that, start to explain why you do the steps and develop their understanding for the concepts underlying things like pre-processing or creating a model in fMRI data. So the goal is, after you have both of these things, which seems pretty simple, is one, you both remember the steps, you know how to do them, and you're able to then apply those concepts flexibly across different scenarios and different contexts which you know, is kind of a dream of mine that you know, this, these you know, training materials would become both accessible and also shed some light on why people are doing what they're doing. And then they can adjust them as they need to. It's, you know, it's always said that uh, no two people really know the same thing. And there's a lot of truth to that because you, know, you tell an elementary school kid two plus two equals four. And you, tell the, you can tell the same thing to an adult, but they're going to have different uh, associations about that information and also see different potentials about how they can apply it to different scenarios. So the more you can uh, 
clearly show how these concepts operate, the more it's going to stick around and the more easily they'll be able to use it in different situations. So how do we make those concepts as clear as possible and get them to stick? Well, this was another thing I came across on the AFNI website. They have great documentation, by the way. I think out of the big three, which are AFNI, SPM, FSL, I believe, AFNI by far has the best documentation. It's thorough. They have a lot of good examples, and they also have some humor, which is their, their saving grace. Some people find it really annoying, but I find it endearing. And that may explain why I got to where I am today. Anyway, so I saw this animation on the website, and I was blown away because th this was, uh, again, this was maybe 2009, 2010, so really just when I was starting to do it for my analysis and starting to, to get involved in my own projects. And this was to show how the, the bold response unfolds over time. And I use this all the time if, if I'm ever, you know, talking about the, the physiology and the hemodynamics of the bold signal. So imagine that I give you a stimulus like that, and then you see this stereotypical pattern of activity, if we had fine enough time resolution, unfolding over a period of, you know, 12, maybe more seconds. But when you show somebody like that, and you show it dynamically, it becomes, for me, I like to, to use the term, uh, you get a more like a visceral understanding of what's going on. When I saw this, I thought, man, I wish that I had created that because that that's, it seems really simple and it is. And it's not like people can't understand this if they don't have the animation. But the point I'm trying to make and which I'll emphasize repeatedly throughout this talk is let's say that if, if you were like me, I'm kind of an old timer at this point. I, I don't feel that bad about making, uh, you know, older people jokes because I'll become one eventually and I'll be on the butt of the jokes. And it's like, I think it's okay. But uh, <laughs> I'm hoping that joke landed and everybody's not like <laughs> looking like shocked or offended because I can't see you, but whatever. Um, I'm assuming it was okay. But, uh, but the, anyway, it was a long time ago when I started, you know, learning this. And back in the day, we, you know, we would have these textbooks like the, the Huddle uh, Song and McCarthy textbook, fMRI analysis. And you'd see panel one, panel two, right? So here's like time point one when something happens, then time point two after some process or you apply some technique. And it's up to the reader to mentally fill in the invisible link for what happens between this point and this point. And that's a good exercise. You know, people should do that. You know, people should still read the, the, the books and the papers and, and try to understand that. But for newcomers, especially to something like, something as abstract and complex as fMRI analysis, the reader's convenience would be served by making that link explicit with an animation like this one. And once they have that basic concept, you can then build on that to explain more sophisticated concepts like convolution. So instead of just having one, let's say we have two or even three bold responses, and they're all summing together, creating this more complex waveform outlined in blue. So when somebody sees this, they understand how that noisy time signal they see with their data relates to the underlying bold responses if they actually exist in response to their condition. Uh, for me, learning about the GLM and how it applies to fMRI data was, was a real bear. And I remember when I was a lab manager, I asked somebody, what's a beta weight? Because I read about a beta weight and I didn't, it wasn't really clear to me what it meant. And he said, I'll never forgive him for this. He said that, oh, that's really complicated. I was like, oh man, if he, if he can't explain it to somebody like me, that must be like way over my head and I don't really need to bother with that. Uh, that's, that was total nonsense. And even though it can be somewhat complex if somebody doesn't have a strong statistics or signal processing background, you can still explain it. Because if we know what the bold response looks like and we know what our time course looks like, which is in this 
uh, shaded in gray here, all you're doing is you're modulating the amplitude of those bold responses to best fit the data for each of those conditions. And the beta weight is simply how much you're scaling the amplitude of the bold response. So I use those animations all the time because I think they're brilliant. And I, this got me interested in creating my own because I thought this was really cool. Once I started putting the pieces of the puzzle together, I was about midway through grad school. So we're talking 2012, 2013. Uh, I thought, okay, so I, I have these screencasts that I'm making. They seem to be pretty useful. It's over the shoulder. Um, I know that it's, it's working because I start with a certain data set and then we get some output at the end. And if you follow the steps exactly, you will get the same thing. And it should only be minor modifications to apply to your data. But we can also add something else on top of that, which is animations both, uh, say, before the screencast and afterwards to set the stage and then reinforce what they learn. The pattern, the, the design that I've been working with recently is uh, I'll start, say, uh, a, a tutorial video. Say we're covering something like ROI analysis, which I'll show you in a second. I'll start out with, say, a minute or two of you know me talking. And then as I'm talking, there will be some animation fading in explaining what exactly is, say, ROI analysis. Okay, why should you care? What does it look like? And then the middle section is actually seeing how it's done step by step. So you can see what it looks like with your software package of choice. And then an outro summarizing what you learned and more animations if necessary. Okay, so moving to uh, the present, which I'm defining as uh, roughly, say, early 2016 to today is when I started taking, uh, you know, the whole concept of animations, production values, the viewer's convenience more seriously. Um, th this is a pretty good schematic for how I use animations to, to try to convey certain concepts. Okay. So it, the way that I always like to present ROIs is first of all, you know, talk about the actual volumes that we collect, which are like these giant Rubik's cubes, these snapshots we take of the brain. And each of the smaller cubes in that bigger cube is a voxel, right? And each voxel contains, you know, certain numbers. And, you know, we can create these through contrasts. You can have them in your time series, but it's really the same basic idea. But with ROI analysis, we're interested in contrasts. And let's say we chisel out a subset of voxels, like a two by two by two smaller cube out of this bigger cube in whichever region you're interested in. Each one of those voxels is going to contain a number, which you can think of as, say, a contrast estimate, or parameter estimate, or whatever you're extracting uh, your data from. Contrast map, parameter map, whatever. All you're doing in an ROI analysis is you're adding up all of those numbers and taking the average to get a single number for that condition per subject. You do that across all the subjects in your study. You get a single number per subject, run a t-test on all those numbers, and then you publish it. I photoshopped that. That's not a real article. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't publish in scientific reports on M and M's. I forget why I made that, but uh, you know. Okay, so th that's a that's just an example of how how I've been thinking about uh, you know conveying this information. And in the actual video there would be a voiceover, and these days I, I more or less script them. I, I type them out, I do multiple takes, and try to make it as, as clean as possible without interruptions. And this brings me to production values, which I've been focusing more on in recent years. And when you mentioned that, it seems to have kind of a, a superficial connotation, which I, I, w I want to make a strong argument in favor of production values because 
for me, it's inextricably bound up with how I'm presenting the material. A few simple rules I, I try to follow. One is that they're concise. So anything I make, you know, seven minutes tops, I try to get it within the five minute ballpark. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes on both, you know, with the scripting, with uh, thinking about, okay, if, if this is a command that's, that takes a long time to process, you know, is, is, there, is there a certain time where I could speed through part of it without people becoming confused or disoriented? Now, it's not always possible to, to talk about a, a really complex concept in five to seven minutes. And that's why you know, I've started to try to create series of videos to have each one be self-contained, but also part of a larger series. Uh, second, good audio and video. Doesn't always happen, but back when I was at Haskins Laboratories, it's a linguistics laboratory, and a really cool thing about that lab was they had an anechoic chamber. Has anybody ever been in one of those? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I can't see you. Um, they're kind of creepy because you don't get the, the natural echoes that you would find in any other room. They're designed to cancel those things out, so your voice sounds very strange. But it makes for very good recording quality, which is the reason why they had that in a linguistics lab. So on the weekends I would come in, I jerry-rigged this recording studio, basically, and, you know, tried to... Okay, if people are looking for information about how to do fMRI analysis, it's not fun, right? It's not something people do on the weekends to kill some time. Knowing that, well, if you do, that's fine, God bless you, but most people don't do that. <laughs> So knowing that, how can we make it as, you know, attractive and inviting as possible, right? So that people don't feel like their time is being wasted. It's not an assault on their eyes and their ears. They don't need to really try to figure out what you're saying because it's not clear or they can't see something because it's too small, right? Which is where things like, you know, zooming in, pans, highlighting, you know, slowing down once in a while to, to really flesh out something. That's where that all comes into play. I take it really seriously because if nothing else, most of what I do has grown out of irritation with, with a lot of what's out there. A lot of things, they're not, for somebody like me who is first starting out, they're not accessible. And I get it, you, you can't satisfy everybody, and it's a disaster if you, if you try to do that. But in a lot of cases, I felt like there could have been something more that could have been done to make it a little bit easier to understand. And when some, when some groups have, say, put up uh, videos trying to explain concepts, they can be like 40, 50 minutes, and maybe you already know some of the uh, prefatory material, and you want to get to something that you didn't know, but there's a lot of video to slog through. And so in that case, you know, things like chapter markers are very useful for getting to the information you need. Again, it's really about the viewer's convenience. So I try to be very, very sensitive to that. And lastly, as I alluded to earlier, creating series of videos, breaking it up, making it bite-sized, and creating playlists so that they can jump to the information they need. And again, it's all about convenience. Uh, when I first started out, each video was really like the problem of the week that I was trying to solve. And I did, and I thought, oh, I'll just, you know, record this. If I make mistakes, you know, whatever, that's fine. But they would usually run for a pretty long time, and you don't want to see the mistakes. You want those things to get edited out because they're totally irrelevant, unless you're trying to illustrate a point. Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions about any of that so far? I'm going to shift gears a little bit and start talking about what I'm doing today at Michigan. No questions, I think. Okay. Auburn? What, what'd you say? Nothing. Au no questions. Auburn? Oh. We Skype in a, another university. Oh, oh, okay. I did see another group there. Yeah. They are with... <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right.
So where I am today, I am in Michigan. Uh, I'm from Minnesota originally. And I'll tell you right now, the one thing that really annoys me is when people say, oh, you're used to the cold, so it's going to be okay here. It's like, I've experienced very cold temperatures, but I still don't like it. <laughs> people don't seem to understand that. I'm sure Alabama is a lot. Uh, I, I would like it. <laughs> No. Yeah. No it's, it's humid. Yes, humid. Oh. oh, you can't have it all. You could go to Los Angeles, but yeah, not a fan of that. Uh, so today, the group that I was hired to be a part of is the Neuroimaging Initiative, or NII, which I, I thought was kind of cute. And this is a collaboration between researchers at Michigan and specifically it's consulting for anybody who does neuroimaging. So if you, as a researcher, you could be anybody, you know, graduate student, PI, whatever. If you collect data, excuse me, off of the scanner at the university, you are entitled to have me or a couple of other people who form kind of the core consulting group at NII to, to help you out. Right? So we have office hours, we are always available, we have our own you know, email listserv if you want to post to that. And it's really, you know, anybody who does any kind of imaging, whether it be you know, fMRI, structural and free surfer, or diffusion imaging, which has become more popular here recently, you basically, I mean, that's the reason why I'm hired is mostly to, to, to help out those people. Um, and there are several different groups on campus. There's three parts of campus. There's central campus, which is you know psychology and where a lot of the researchers are. There's north campus where the actual magnet is, the fMRI lab. And then east campus, way out there, but they have the psychiatry building and they have a lot of people who do imaging there as well. So a large part of what I do, you know, month to month is trying to keep all the groups happy and also talking to each other. So if there's one group who has expertise in diffusion imaging, right? So I know a little bit about it, but there's another postdoc over in this group over here who knows a ton about it and is very fluent with it. He may know things that I don't, and it could be useful for me to either you know, convey that information to a group that needs it or get those two people talking together. Things like diffusion, uh, machine learning, graph theory, you know, I don't know at all, but I can know who knows what. And it's a big university, so connecting people like that is also a big part of what I do. Uh, more specifically, digging into my role, I'm on a, a self-made schedule so far, which is to uh, conduct workshops every two to three months, investigating some new technique or trying to stay current with what the latest techniques are. This is a screenshot of uh, constrained spherical deconvolution from a program called MR Tricks. It's excellent. I really love it. I used FSL's TBSS for DTI analysis for a while, but DTI has problems with crossing fibers, which have been well documented. And MR Tricks not only is it great for visualizing, but it's uh, I think in a lot of ways it's a superior package. So I started trying to stay current on, you know, what packages, what methods seem to have staying power, right? Because I don't know if this has happened to you, but some people spend a year or two learning a package and then support is discontinued because the developers go into industry. And that can be a huge time sink. I'm sure it's happened to, to some people around here. So, but MR Trick seems to have some staying power. Another thing, do people rec do people recognize this title? Mm, yes. Yes. Okay. Ooh, kind of a little uh, controversial, I would say. And <laughs> I, I got to think. A journal club about it. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's coming out with another one. It's Great. like, uh, <laughs> you know, if this was Halloween one, this is like the sec the sequel. You know, it's like a horror movie franchise. It keeps coming. And, but I got to thank these guys because indirectly they may have helped me uh, get this job here. 
I'll tell you why. So this this came out maybe two years ago, give or take. And as I'm sure most of you know, if you're around at the time, this this caused a huge uproar because it wasn't only within neuroimaging; it got picked up by the the popular press as well, and there was you know some some, some outrage about how you know all these fMRI researchers they're being sloppy and they're wasting all your money, uh, whatever. But well, not whatever. But the point was, uh, a lot of people on campus here were asking themselves, okay, is this actually a problem? Have they have they clearly stated the problem? If it is, is it a problem for me and my lab? And if it is a problem, what do we do about it? So when this thing came out, the NII hadn't been formed yet. But it got people together who said it would be great if we had, you know, a dedicated group of people who are on top of things like this and who could give recommendations about what to do in case, you know, you're one of the labs who may be in trouble, according to that paper. That was really the impetus from what they told me. And lastly, uh, this kind of recapitulates what I was talking about earlier. You know, giving giving workshops, just uh, making sure we're not only staying current with new techniques, but also revisiting the basics as needed. All right. So these days, uh, kind of following on those initial goals I sketched out several years ago, is is again threefold. The first is I want uh, anybody that, say, I'm assisting here at Michigan or anybody that I'm helping out through uh, the, the videos or the documentation to be able to make educated choices. I still like just getting people, having their feet on the ground, doing some stuff, not running into errors every second that they type something in. But beyond that, I do like them to start to develop some intuition for why you may do an analysis one way versus another way. One great uh, training technique, I guess you could call it, that I've been trying to develop lately is get people to do stuff the wrong way. Like get them to be bad, you know? Like have them do stuff that just would not fly for a journal, right? I'll give you an example. Uh, last week, I was giving a, an AFNI workshop at uh, Milwaukee. And we were talking about ROI analysis. And then we talked about the, the so-called voodoo correlations or circular analyses, where you define a region that's already significant, and then you extract data from that region. So by definition, it's significant and a group analysis is invalid. And so, you know, we know how to do the ROI analysis now, and we know how not to do it. And at some point, you're like, hey, you know, if you actually want to know if you're doing something wrong, let's do it the wrong way. You know, and it's kind of fun. It's kind of, you know, taboo. You're doing something that's clearly, you know, crazy from a statistical perspective, but it's fun. It's a, it's a safe environment. We're not going to publish this stuff. And you could argue that I may be giving people... Uh, the techniques to do things in a basically use it for for evil and not good. I don't really buy that. I think it's really effective for teaching and also it solidifies the concepts that they learned. And once you know how to do it the wrong way, then you clearly you should know when you're doing it the wrong way as opposed to the right way. And that's part of making an educated choice. Uh, second, as I've harped on repeatedly, these animations. Uh, you know, I still think that they're very, very effective. Uh, I still remember just how how clearly it organized different pieces of knowledge in my mind when I saw that HRF animation from the AFNI people. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to do a similar thing when we're talking about other concepts like, uh, let's say, mixed models in fMRI analysis or doing something like uh, constrained spherical deconvolution in MR tricks. And lastly, what I've been doing in the past year is recording all the talks and all the workshops that I give. So if it's at 
Michigan or if I'm traveling to Milwaukee or Amherst, I try to record it because, you know, it could fill in some gaps for, for, for other people who weren't there. And there's several advantages. One, if somebody can't make it to the talk or the workshop, it's no sweat. They can look at it later. Uh, two, from a personal perspective, this helps me determine, you know, how my speaking is going. You know, am I speaking clearly? Is the structure of my talks good? You know, if I'm look right now, I'm, I'm capturing the screen of everything that I'm showing you all with my voice being recorded over it. And so if I go back and I look at some sections of it, you know, if I try to put myself in the mind of somebody who is completely new to it, would this make sense? Or can I think of some obstacle that comes up to understanding? And how could I, how could I get around that? <laughs> this is also a good time to tell you that you're all being recorded. So if you say anything uh, <laughs> too crazy, um, mm -hmm. for a fee, I will edit it out. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, no worries. I'm just kidding. Okay, <laughs> kind of. Uh, so, <laughs> so some recently completed projects and then segueing into the, to, to the future and what I want to do. So a few series and also workshops I've given recently are diffusion tensor imaging analysis with uh, TBSS, a series of videos on volumetric analysis with FreeSurfer, in case, and all these things are available online, by the way. Um, the free surfer one was really interesting because it's notorious for taking a long time. And I found some methods to cut down on that significantly, specifically, you know, offloading it to a supercomputer. If your campus doesn't have one, the, the U S government does. And if you're a researcher, you, you can use it. And lastly, connectivity analyses and PPI with AFNI which I'm trying to extend to the other packages like SPM, FSL, and also taking into account uh, new processing techniques. Especially with resting state, it seems like there's a new, new method for pre-processing comes out every year or so. Five so, days? Five days, yeah. <laughs> there's a quote by a, a French writer it's way back, 16th century. His name was Rabelais, Rabelais. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, what was it, what was it? Why did the old folly end now and not sooner? And why did the new wisdom begin now and not later? And I always, I think it's a brilliant quote. And I, <laughs> it's like, no, we, we got it now. We know the right way to analyze resting state data. It's like, no, you don't. But we try, to, we try to do the best that we can with what we have. Okay, so the future. It's always a, a mugs game to try to predict what's, what's going to happen. But here are a few ideas that I have. And I really started thinking about this because a couple months ago, we were wrapping up our fMRI course here at Michigan, which, by the way, I would encourage all of you to apply for it. I think, I don't know if the application's open yet, but be on the lookout for it. Usually the deadline I think is in December or January, not sure, but just look for University of Michigan fMRI course. Uh, it's great, two weeks, we cover everything. We cover a couple other concepts like uh, MVPA, PPI, other statistical techniques. And so we had a Q&A session at the very end, and one of the last questions for everybody, we had like a panel discussion where all the lecturers and all the, the, the lab assistants were, were answering questions from the audience. And one of them was, what do we think is the area for the most improvement? Where's the most improvement needed in fMRI? And, you know, some people said, well, maybe with SNR or with such and such technique. And me, I, you know, I'm biased, obviously, but I said, I think that the, uh, the area which has the greatest potential for improvement is probably the teaching part of it. Because fMRI has really exploded. We have people from all different kinds of backgrounds, you know, statistics, computer science, neuroscience, cognitive psychology, 
a, a bunch of different backgrounds, and it, it's extremely rare you find everybody with the perfect balance and combination of all those different attributes. So the more that we can make this accessible to as wide an audience as possible and also get them to uh, you know, use, use the techniques appropriately and for good and not evil, I think that's, that's going to be a really important part. Um, for me here at Michigan, the future is going to be, again, staying on a workshop schedule, focusing on different topics at different times during the year, and I'll show you a sample timeline. Uh, trying to experiment with workshops to try to make them as effective and as accessible as possible. And lastly, with the advent of really large-scale online data sets, to try to get people to use them and try to get to direct people to the topics they need to get to, you know, what they want. So maybe I want you know, a social neuroscience data set or I want a data set that I can apply MVPA to. When you say curate online data sets, yeah. are you saying like take a piece of like say the HCP data and put it up somewhere else in a slightly different format so it's easier to analyze or do you mean something different? Oh, that's a good question. Um, not, not that exactly, but maybe with something like the HCP data, um, you know, providing examples for uh, maybe certain subsets of it that could be analyzed in a certain way. Say you're doing something with like a longitudinal design and just pointing out like here, here are data sets either on open neuro or HCP that are, that you could use for that. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it's not obvious from the title what different techniques you could apply to a data set. So it could save you some time if you don't want to design your own MVPA friendly study but you still want to learn it, you still want to get your hands dirty, you can find that data set more easily. I see. Yeah. That's, that's a good point, though. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't think HCP would have anything against that if you downloaded it, analyzed it, uploaded it somewhere else. Maybe they might file an injunction, but I, I doubt it. Yeah, I, I think that's a good idea. I mean... I might steal it. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> you do it first, and then. No, take it. Time. <laughs> yeah. So here's a sample timeline. Uh, what I've been working with so far. So maybe if we divide the entire year into four quarters, you know, three months each, we could devote one quarter to machine learning MVPA, then make con maybe connectivity, uh, diffusion analysis, and then maybe graph theory. And for each one of these. What I've been doing so far, for example, with diffusion imaging, um, I have a three workshop format outlined. We had the first one back in August, which was an introduction to diffusion and analyzing a sample data set in TBSS. The second one was an introduction to MR tricks and how it compares to the diffusion tensor imaging analysis. And then the last one is going to be starting to build um, connectivity matrices based on these uh, tracks that you can create. So you can constrain them by nodes parcelated in different ways and then try to quantify the amount of uh, connection between them. And also um, trying to develop exercises that they can use to build their understanding. And that's easier said than done, which is why I'm trying to experiment with workshops to see how you know you can present the exercises most effectively. You know, try not to waste people's time. Um, when I was at Milwaukee again last week, it was 30 people. We were all in a computer lab and it takes a lot of preparation to, to make sure that the scripts are going to work on their computers and that, you know, if I'm demonstrating something, everybody can follow along and not get too tangled up. It, it's, it's very nerve rattling because you don't know if there's going to be like a dependency error or some hardware issue. It, it really is, you know, whatever, it, it's, it's hard, that's what I'm trying to say. But experimenting with workshops, um, to, to make sure that everybody is basically on the same page, this was something I did uh, before uh, the Amherst workshop earlier this year, um, give people 
some videos to give them the background specifically for what they'll be working with, right? So this was an FSL workshop. We were going to use Unix to do scripting, you know, loop it over all the subjects. But before they could use that, they needed to know some details, some fundamentals about Unix and, and shell scripting. So I created a few, you know, basic Unix tutorials just so that if I said something like CD LS or a for loop, they wouldn't be confused and we could spend more time on the more interesting stuff and they would have the fundamentals they would need, like the bare basics in place. And in the future, something else I'd like to do is if I'm ever presenting a workshop at a university and it seems like it, it wouldn't be too much of an imposition, actually use a data set from one of the labs at that university as a demonstration. And this could kill a couple birds with one stone. You know, you'd be learning the technique and also you'd be analyzing somebody's data who need, actually needs it analyzed. The online data sets are great too, but they can also be uh, you know, somewhat limited for, for obvious reasons. So, you know, again, we'll see if this happens. This is all work in progress. Um, but I, I, I'm curious, I wanna see if this is actually practical or not. Now the third part, curate online data sets, I, I've already spoken a little bit about. The two major ones that come to mind, obviously, are openfmri.org and the Human Connectome Project. And for me, this, why I think this is such an interesting development, having all this open access fMRI data, it's because, you know, looking back 10 years ago, I had just graduated college. I, I went to Carleton College, which is a small college in Northfield, Minnesota. Who's laughing? I went there. That's what? That's cool. Cows, Cows Colleges and Contentment? Yeah, that's my... Okay, well, <laughs> that's our motto. Northfield's motto. Uh, Ooh, all right, yeah. go Knights, yeah. Um... <laughs> there are two neuroscientists that went to no there's a lot more than two but there's two in neuroimaging wow <laughs> all right okay totally unrelated has anybody seen fresh prince of bel-air i'm assuming a lot of hands are going up um <laughs> the people who went to carlton let me know if you 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 know this okay but this is the, the maybe an urban legend but apparently one of the writers the show writers went to St. Olaf, which is our rival school in Northfield, right? And if you recall, Will Smith's nerdy, dweeby brother was named Carlton. But it was spelled wrong. I, but I still think that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good story. Come on. Um, if that gives you a sense of how they were viewed for St. Olaf. I believe it. I believe the story. <laughs> anyway... <th> <laughs> So I was at Carleton a long time ago. It's a small school. We don't have R01 resources. We don't have a scanner, right? But if I could go back in time with what we have today, which are, uh, you know, some of these open access data sets and tutorials to help you learn that, for those students who are in those situations where they want to know about neural imaging, but they are you know, at a smaller school, they don't have access to it, they don't have the opportunity. This gives them the opportunity to at least develop some of the skills so that they can be more competitive. So we'll see if it happens. This isn't geared towards people like that, obviously, but it's definitely something that could be used by uh, individuals or labs at smaller schools. Um, I think I've said everything I wanted to about looking forward. Uh, you know, I, I do think, again, that it, the teaching part of it, that making it accessible is, is one of the areas for the greatest amount of growth in neuroimaging. And I'm really excited to, to, be, to be part of that. So thank you all for your attention and I will now open it up to any questions. Okay, one second. I can, I can see you now. What's, you see us now? Yeah, oh, I can see you. Do you guys have questions? I'm going to 
assume no. Any questions? Okay. okay. Yeah. About what? About any fMRI questions? Excuse me? A about neuroimaging questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the best way to reach me would be through email. Um, okay. It's ajahn at umich.edu. Uh, you could probably find it pretty easily. Um, yeah, so I, I, I do my best to, tr I, I do get a lot of questions from different labs, and I try my best to to answer them in a timely manner. But um, usually if it's like, like, like a lower level question, something that is pretty easy to answer, take care of, I can get to those you know pretty quickly. And if it's a more involved question, I'll also answer those as well. But if it's from uh, the same person, the same lab, and it's really in depth and it's repeated, you, okay, you may not like this, but usually I say, you know, if you want further assistance, you actually like want to talk to me and I could even look at the data, like the, we'll work out like a consulting fee. I've been doing that for a couple of years, but for, for basic questions, um, you know, they're basically free. They, they are free. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to them. But if it, if it's, if it's going to take uh, a lot of time, if it's something I got to you know spend weekends on, then I throw the, the fee at them and, Sometimes magically, when you tell them that you're charging, they figure it out, and <laughs> you know, it's kind of an incentive. Yeah. So, so is one of the goals of the NII to um, validate these methods? That that you're, I mean, essentially, what you're doing is you're distributing methods. Yeah. To the world, you know, in a, in mm -hmm. a way that, that they can use it better, um, which is in itself quite useful. Um, do you see, or do, do, do people in the, in this, um, in, initiative see one of the supplemental goals to be to validate those methods? That's a good question. Uh, that's not explicit, but with something like say with MR tricks, I encourage people to apply it to their own data because I'll have some sample scripts. I'll have an example data set, but I don't have any diffusion data of my own that I'm using for the demonstration. And so what I want people to, to do is, okay, so here are some tools with MR tricks you can use for uh, denoising, for cleanup, for doing a different kind of um, model fitting for the fibers in each voxel. Now apply that to your data set because I'm really curious if that's an improvement over what you're doing right now. Because most people, they, they want to, to be using new techniques. They want to look at their data from different perspectives. And so I guess it's implied in a way that we are trying to validate these techniques, see if they actually make sense, see if they work, and see if people are happy with them. Um, are NII resources available to um, hospital-based researchers in Michigan, like if someone's at Children's of Michigan um, or somewhere like that? Yes, they are. Yeah, there's a group. There's a, a group from anesthesiology that I've actually been helping out, and they do their scanning at the hospital, I believe. Okay. Yeah. But so far, it hasn't been it hasn't been overwhelming. I mean, it definitely keeps me busy. There's you know many different labs. Some make more demands than others on my time, but overall, um, no no single lab has really tried to monopolize all the NII resources or make, you know, inordinate demands. Yeah. Good. Good question. Mm -hmm. So how did NII, like, you said this was, this came about two years ago. Yeah. So it, it, was it the whole university coming together to do this or was it just a primary group of people that, you know, to get the resources to create this? Yeah, so. it was driven mainly by the fMRI lab because you know before I got here, the people at the fMRI lab uh, who were mainly physicists, they would you know, answer questions as, as best they could about the data that they were collecting. But when something like the Eklund paper came out, this was a little bit more conceptual, it was more to do with the statistics and you know, how you estimate smoothness. 
Uh, and I would say the two primary drivers creating the, the NII were, were, were two people. There was uh, John Janitas and Cindy Lustig. That's my, impre- that's my impression. What, what's that? Sorry, we know Cindy. Oh, yeah. No, Cindy's awesome. She's great. Yeah. And you know John. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah they're, great, they're great people. Uh, so, I mean, they, basically, they sent out a survey, and they said, would you, anybody who's doing neuroimaging, would you like to see something like this? And they had an overwhelming response. And so, um, you know, if, uh, a few people put their heads together and their grants together, and they said, let's try to make this position available. So how many positions are there within it? I mean, I'm looking at your website, it looks like eight. Yeah, yeah, so the the ones primarily who do the consulting, it's me for the imaging stuff, and then there's uh, Bennett Falber, Mike Engstead, who Mm -hmm. also answers some imaging questions, but they also have expertise in, say, using the cluster for analysis and any kind of Unix computer troubleshooting issues they address. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, people like Cindy, people like John, they're kind of at a higher level organizing, you know, regular meetings for the people who do imaging to both share research, uh, share any problems that have come up, either technical or statistical or otherwise, and mm-hmm. show how they address those so that everybody is on the same page. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. For many years to, anyway, it's hard. Yeah. (laughs) I'm impressed with what you guys have gotten together. It's really good. Again, I just got here. I've only been here a few months, but. I'm impressed that Cindy has gotten together. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But but I think it's worked out really well, and it's a great group to work for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Any other questions? All right. Let's give me a hand. All right. Thank you.